Yes. Yeah. Uh, friends, good evening. Welcome to our webinar today. Our guest speaker is Dr. Uh, uh, this is a collaborative webinar, which is a webinar between Indian Arthroscopy Society and uh, SESI, uh, the Shoulder and Elbow Society of India. Uh, I must thank Dr. Shriyash for putting this show and also thank Dr. Ram Chidambaram for uh, getting this collaborative webinar. It's a wonderful webinar today because our guest speaker is Dr. Basam Al T. Alsan. He's uh, uh, recently moved uh, to Boston from Mayo Clinic. Uh, he's an authority into shoulder, uh, especially about tendon transfers around rotator cuff uh, tears. And that is our topic today, the tendon transfers in irreparable uh, rotator cuff tear. Where are we today? Uh, Shriyash will kindly introduce our guest speaker today, though he needs no introduction, but just a brief uh, uh, introduction, followed by his presentation. Ram, if you can kindly speak some words and then Shriyash can share the uh, the credentials of our guest speaker today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, IPS, uh, Sanindu Samantha, and Shreyas. It's a nice collaboration between the two societies, and uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege and the honor to have uh, Professor Basim and Hassan here. Uh, it's from Mayo Clinic. He's done phenomenal work on uh, tendon transfer uh, for irreparable rotator cuff tear and uh, a lot of uh, complex shoulder problems, as well as he's a good uh, hand surgeon, too. Uh, for uh, those who don't know much about that aspect. But here we have him uh, to talk about irreparable rotator cuff tears. As far as the uh, irreparable rotator cuff tear is uh, considered, uh, traditionally we have been uh, taught uh, latissimus dorsi is an answer for a posterior superior cuff tear. And second problem is the irreparable anterior tear, which is subscapularis retracted tear in the context of isolation or with orthoplasty and we think possibly pectoral is major transfer. But today we have Basim Hassan with his own ideas, he's popularized a couple of uh, famous uh, tendon transfer, and he's going to break the myth and going to show uh, light on these two uh, topic. Uh, with that introduction, I, uh, I would request the shares to give a formal introduction for Professor Basim Hassan. Thank you. Hello everyone, and uh, thank you Dr. IPS Obera and Dr. Ram Chidabaran. Really, it's an honor to have both the societies uh, together today and uh, to discuss uh, this uh, very important topic on tendon transfers, where are we today? So patients with irreparable rotator cuff tears present a diagnostic and treatment challenge. In the present day when managing this problem, especially in the young active patient, existing literature has little in the way of comparative studies of the various available treatment options. And tendon transfers, today's topic is one such option. And to share his expertise on this, we have Dr. Basim Al Hassan from Boston, USA, a world expert in the evaluation and management of scapulothoracic disorders and tendon transfers around the shoulder and elbow. He is the co chief shoulder service, Massachusetts General Hospital, and program director of the Shoulder Surgery Fellowship. He received his medical degree at the American University of Beirut and thereafter completed his residency in orthopedic surgery at the University of Illinois in Chicago and subsequently a fellowship in hand and upper extremity at the Mayo Clinic and an additional fellowship in shoulder and elbow surgery at the Mass General Boston. He joined Mayo Clinic in 2007 and in addition was a professor of orthopedic surgery at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. During that time, he won the Mayo Clinic Teacher of the Year Award for two consecutive years in 2009 and 10 and his upper extremity service was voted as one of the best rotations for the Mayo Clinic's residents and fellows. It was only last month that he has relocated to Boston and joined the Massachusetts General Hospital. He has been in innovative in the field of upper extremity surgery and has developed numerous novel procedures, 20 new surgical upper limb procedures through dedicated anatomic and biomechanical studies and has published over 125 peer-reviewed articles and authored 30 book chapters and has presented at numerous meetings both nationally and internationally. So really, both societies are... Uh, honored and privileged to have his presence today. And I would kindly request him to please uh, share his screen and give us his talk on tendon transfers for irreparable rotator cuff tears. Where are we today? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction and thank you for having me with you today. And uh, I'm glad we have this time mix, which was fun. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna share my screen. And because I have, I think enough time, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cover two topic I'm going to talk about uh, the massive irreparable uh, rotator cuff tear from two perspectives. In fact, I'll try to include even a third perspective. 
And uh, I should mention that most of my, you're going to see most of the slides, they're still Mayo slide because all of this work, I've done it well. I was at the, I done, I was at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, but uh, yes, as was mentioned, I'm currently working at the Mayo General Hospital uh, in Boston. And um, um, I'm uh, hoping to continue with the same uh, legacy as we started uh, at, in, uh, at the Mayo Clinic. So I'm going to st start to talk about the anterior tears first, and then we'll talk about the posterior superior tetra cuff tear. And here I'm talking about irreparable tear. Irreparable tear, and we can, of course, have it in the discussion, what does it mean? But in general, for most of us, if we have short tendon, retracted, advanced fatty atrophy, this is considered irreparable rotator cuff tear. Now, whenever you have an irreparable uh, anterior superior rotator cuff tear, it's not only someone who has rotator cuff and they come and they have no subscap. There are a few scenarios that we see, and some of them are more challenging than others. So uh, usually if they come only with a subscap insufficiency, usually they have limitation of their rotation, they have pain, occasionally mild anterior subluxation, but uh, their function is not too, too bad, except the supraspinatus is also involved. But we have harder situation where sometime, and this is, we see it often in young patient, uh, when you have a bad comminuted fracture of the proximal humerus that you wanna do a hemi on, for example, and the patient's still young, and the patients start to subluxate uh, because there is no subscap. Now, these are very, very difficult problems, but because the patients are young, uh, they're an alternative to do a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And occasionally I've seen these, which are which now I have, in fact, collection of cases. Me and GD were cell phone friends, we're publishing about these. We have 19 patients, I think, yes, 19, who had a failed lethargy with irreparable subscap. This is really, really bad. I would call it the triple or quadruple tri uh, bad triad because um, quadruple uh, bad uh, situation because you have young patient, bone, glenoid is gone, the subscap is gone, and sometimes you have arthritis as well. And the patient sometimes are 20, 25. And this is mostly technical, by the way, because the patient have insufficiency and people want to do a Letarge, and if they are not very skilled at it, sometimes they detach the subscap, reattach it back, and sometimes the subscap detach and the bone resorb, the patient starts to subluxate, <clears throat> and now we don't have a subscap. Now, when we talk about the reconstruction of the subscap or the anterior superior theta cuff, the most common reported tendon transfer is pectoralis major. Now, uh, in uh, Early on, I'm going to show you right now like a few images about how it was done. So they've taken sternal head, superficial or deep to the conjoint tendon, or clavicular, all the whole pectoralis, and they've done different type of technique. The other technique is pectoralis minor because it looks closer to the subscap. Also, it was described as such a small tendon. But again, I will talk in a minute about the line of pull and the mechanics, and it could be done also superficial or deep to the conjoint. And just to give credit to two great surgeons and mentors and like innovators, Christian Gerber and Herbert Resch, they really, really, they've done this for a long period of time, much, much, much earlier than me. And they have a very, very good outcome about this one. Even they have long-term outcome, I think 10 years even more, or some of them have 15 or even 20. So uh, the PEC transfer does work. For me, I'm not very sure why, but it does work. I haven't done a single pack transfer except in reverse shoulder arthroplasty, but I've not done it a single time for irreparable subscap, and I'll tell you why. Uh, if you look at this uh, anatomic dissection, looking from the side of the body, you look at the, at the pectoralis major. This is cut here, pectoralis minor. This is a chest, this is a scapula, and you look at the subscap. So, now, if you look at the chest configuration, you have the pectoralis anterior, the scapula is posterior. So don't think about the subscap anymore, anterior, posterior. Think about the subscap and the rotator cuff in the scapula, which is the shoulder. And this is, again, something I'm going to keep on beating on over and over until everyone start to think that the scapula is a shoulder. It's not independent of the shoulder. It's a shoulder. So now the scapula is sitting on the posterior chest. And the scapula is the house, the house of the rotator cuff. So all the rotator cuff are sitting in the back of the shoulder, of the, of the chest. The pectoralis is in the front of the chest. 
And if you look, you look at some of these front and back, and in a minute now, I'm going to show you. So right now, we are transferring an anterior chest muscle to reconstruct a posterior chest muscle. We say the subscap is anterior. It's anterior relative to the scapula, but it's not anterior relative to the chest. And I think this is a misconcept that happened when the pectoralis major was, was, was invented or someone came up with it because the pectoralis anterior, subscap anterior, let's transfer it. And uh, latissimus is posterior and posterior superior to the cuff, let's transfer it posterior. I think this is wrong. And uh, so this is why we came up with the latissimus for subscap. Remember, the house is in the back. All the rotator cuff sitting in the back of the chest, posterior chest. Any transfer you want to do for the rotator cuff, regardless what it is, it has to come from the posterior chest. So this is to make it easier for you to think about it. The whole rotator cuff sitting on the scapula, it's the house sitting on the posterior chest. Any transfer you want to do, doesn't matter to what muscle, subscap, supra, infra, they have to come from the posterior chest period. This is why we thought about the latissimus to transfer it. Now, uh, the other muscle coming from the posterior chest, from the scapula, that can reconstruct the rotator cuff is a teres major. Now, if you think about it, say like, wait a second, this is confusing. We used to do latissimus, teres major, olipiscopo posterior. Now you're doing it anterior. Anterior to what, my friend? Anterior to what? You are doing it for the rotator cuff still and everything is sitting on the posterior chest. The only thing you're changing the direction. If you take the latissimus posterior, you're constructing posterior superior rotator cuff on the scapula, and if you're transferring anterior, you're anterior to the scapula, but they're all sitting on the posterior chest. So yes, you can transfer latissimus teres major posterior or anterior. The line of pull will change and the function will change. And this is teres major. If you don't have a latissimus, I sometimes transfer it anterior. Now, this is an anatomic study to show that if you try to transfer the teres major, you can definitely transfer it anterior. The only thing, if because of the chubby muscle originating from the scapula with a small tendon, when you transfer it, it may compress the axillary nerve. Whether this is of any clinical consequence, we don't know. And this happened only when you transfer the teres major more proximally on the humerus. Okay? We see this compression. Now, this is an anatomic dissection. And uh, this is, I'm trying to explain to the resident and fellow. Look at the chest. Look, this is the subscap here and the scapula. Again, the scapula is the house sitting in the back. That's the pectoralis major. This is a brachial plexus. And you can see the serratus anterior, this is latissimus. So when we talk about the subscap, this is the subscap. Look at the line of the subscap. It's really about posterior. And now you want to convince me, you want to bring an anterior chest muscle with a completely different vector to reconstruct this muscle. I honestly don't know why it works. And this I presented before over and over. So uh, when we talk about uh, transferring deep to the conjoint, uh, some authors think, yeah, deep to the conjoint it changed the line of pull completely. What does it change the line of pull? Like you're still on the anterior chest, the origin of the muscle on the, on the anterior chest. Now look what happened. This is latissimus transfer. This is pectoralis deep to the conjoint. Now, when you go from external rotation to neutral, which is, this is not what you lose when you don't have subscap, you see this, the pectoralis work very nicely, okay? Now see what happened when you go beyond neutral. The subconjoint, the transfer, what's gonna happen to it? Look what happened now, your internal rotation, what happened? The conjoint tendon is doing nothing for the line of pull. It's essentially the same anterior line of pull. It did not change. So once you go beyond neutral and start to go into internal rotation, the line of pull is completely anterior and there's no change in line of direction at all. Now, if you look, this is from the axillary line, okay? The brachial plexus, that's a latissimus transfer. This is serratus, this is subscap, this is pectoralis. Now, this doesn't require much. Anyone can tell me how this muscle is gonna reconstruct this muscle. It's almost at 90 degree vector. So you need the internal rotation. This is latissimus transfer, causing internal rotation and abduction. Look at the pectoralis. This is pectoralis. This is latissimus. This is subscap. So I'm using this and transferring here to reconstruct this. Imagine in this one, like if you have subluxation, I feel it's going to get worse. And we confirm this uh, with, with a biomechanical study. Everything, we, every time we have an idea, we do an anatomic feasibility study, we do biomechanical study, and then 
we, when we, we believe in it, and this is JD, he did the work, the nice work, and he showed that the abduction internal rotation moment arm is much better with latissimus compared to pectoralis. Now, how do we do it? Uh, if it, with an open technique, if someone needs bone graft, implant, or something, you can do it through the standard deltopectoral. This patient had five surgeries before, repair versus repair, and she had a pec transfer. It failed. On the table, subluxating, she's sitting out, okay? So what you can do if you're doing it open, it's very easy. We all see, because she has already pec transfer, you can see this is latissimus deep to the pec that was transferred before. You can detach it with or without piece of bone. If you can detach a small piece of bone, it will be great. If not, it's okay. And you transfer it proximally to reconstruct it. Now, we, we, now lately we have been for subscap only, like without needing for bony procedure, we have been doing uh, arthroscopic assisted. And you, arthroscopic assisted, um, those who've done latissimus a lot, you, can, you know that you can do it through a very small incision. You can do four, five, six centimeter incision and you harvest the, the latissimus uh, uh, and prepare it, and then you pass it arthroscopically. So this is another one, slightly bigger incision, but now you harvest latissimus, and you go into the subacromial space anteriorly toward the coracoid, and then you do pass the latissimus arthroscopically anteriorly, and you fix it anteriorly. And when you look um, uh, arthroscopically inside the shoulder, this is the tendon, by the way, you can see it here, and this is passed uh, arthroscopically anteriorly. And uh, with the key with this one is how you pass it. You can see it here, passing here. The key is your long grasper has to be between the three structures, okay? You have pectoralis is the roof, conjunct tendon is medial, humerus is lateral. That triangle, if you put your long grasping instrument in between, you're getting to the right direction. And Jean Cani start to do this early on. Uh, Jean Cani and Lonar Foss also do, have done this. And if you have a tear only the subscap, also you can potentially do all arthroscopic, which means you go arthroscopically, you have to do a the transpectoral uh, portal or distal to the pectoralis portal to be able to do the dissection better. And you can detach the latissimus fully. And honestly, the, 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 the surgery is not difficult to do arthroscopic. The tricky part is how to pass a suture, just to do a running suture, which you can do it very much, much easier and open than arthroscopic. But you can hear, tease it, you can see the radial nerve on top here. Always, you know that it's usually gonna be the anterior surface medial and you can have the terrace measure deep to the muscle. And once you have the tendon, you can anchor it like you anchor anything else. Now, if you are dealing with bone defect and, and muscle defect, this is when you do it through open technique, of course. Now for the triadrable or quadruple, uh, uh, trouble, I will call it, when you have bone defect, muscle defect, sometimes arthritis young patient. Uh, these are patients that uh, is, if, if you ask authorities, everyone will tell you fusion or reverse shoulder arthroplasty. But I have a different experience. So for the bone defect, for the arthritis, if you have arthritis, I just do resurfacing arthroplasty. For the bone defect, I use either tricortically recast bone graft or we have uh, allograft here. So we use osteochondral allograft, either tibial plafond or glenoid. And for the soft tissue, we do a latissimus transfer anterior. So this is a patient with a glenoid defect, a irreparable subscap. In this situation, we use a uh, iliac press, but you can use tibial plafond or you can use a glenoid osteochondral allograft if you have it. And then you fix it. It has to be a strong fixation. It has to be a large piece of bone. And then uh, in patients that they need resurfacing because they have arthritis, we perform it at the same time and then do the latissimus transfer for augmentation. And uh, these patients are patients who have done so many surgeries. Like this one, I, if I'm not mistaken, also had six surgeries or five. Uh, and he had a pec transfer, I think with revised pec transfer that failed. And this is him at two years after surgery. Okay. This is another patient. Uh, the lift off test and belly press test, they don't always reverse, by the way. So, but some patients they do. The ER also, the excessive external rotation improved. Like in this patient, he really did extremely, extremely well. And I think even his belly press and lift off test, like you can see, this is his belly. It's not too bad. It's not very normal. It's not too bad. And uh, um, uh, he did really very well. And this is a bear hog test. He did really very, very well with this. And I think his lift off test also was okay. You can see right now, it's cheating a little bit. Let's see if you can be able to do it, this one. You cannot do it. So as you see, like some of these, you cannot reverse them, but you can the patient, get the patient to be better, especially 
with this disaster, I would call it. And this is now in EJSES, you can review it. And this is uh, not about this last technique. This is specifically for irreparable subscap, me and John Kenny, Eric Wagner. We published about our, our uh, experience with open and mostly arthroscopic latissimus transfer for irreparable subscap uh, in uh, 56 patients, uh, 14 arthroscopic and 42 uh, uh, open. And 80% have a significant improvement of symptoms. Five patients had late rupture, two patients underwent RSA. And what we noticed that the factor that affected negatively included the pre-op arthritis, especially Hamada more than two, fixed anterior subluxation and irreparable supraspinatus tear. All right, so this is for the anterior superior rotator cuff. Um, let me know if you want me to proceed with the posterior superior rotator cuff or you want to have questions now. I think we can proceed, uh, Basu. Okay, I'm gonna then proceed with the posterior superior rotator cuff. And here we go. So this one, you've heard it from me much more, but we're gonna start to talk also about principle. And I added things like uh, with Jean Kenny asked me also to talk about this one in his meeting. And I thought since a lot of you right now have heard of the lower trapezius or even done it, I'm gonna tackle most of uh, the principle of the lower trapezius and why we do it. And uh, also some of the question I get very asked very, very often, okay? So, uh, muscle transfers, as you saw notice from the first presentation, I really like to replicate a, a, a tendon tear with the tendon or muscle similar line of pull and tension and excursion. These are the principle of tendon transfer that in reality, they came around the wrist first because the wrist is even this by axle is mostly flexion extension. So it's very easy to transfer tendons from posterior to anterior, anterior to posterior, but the principle apply the same. You need similar line of pull, tension, excursion, one muscle for one loss function and normal strengths. Now the three factors that we can, in a wise way, control and able to, to kind of modify are the first three, because we can pick the muscle. So we can change, we can be able to somehow modify the line of pull and pick the muscle that has the better tension and excursion. And this is a dissection I performed, like this is, of course, the cleaner version of it. I performed a long time ago in 2007 when I started working at Mayo. This is when uh, Alan Bishop asked me, like, what can we do for patients with lack of external rotation and brachial plexus? So we're doing this dissection and remember the idea of the house. So if you look at the scapula, the scapula is the house of the rotator cuff. And you have everything in it, supra, infra, subscap. And if you look at it as a house, don't, you cannot anymore think about a muscle coming from the anterior chest to reconstruct anything in this house. It makes no sense, okay? But if we look, we look, there's almost a second house next to it, which looks very similar to it. It's almost like two triangles. The line of pull of this house is similar to the line of pull of the structure in this house. So if I was able to take this from here to here, it will replicate the function. This is how it came up with. And the more we did it, the more we saw the line of pull perfectly replicate specifically the infraspinatus. But if you think about it, think about it. Infra, this is a vector. Supra, this is a vector. Subscap, this is a vector. So they're all pointing to the same direction, but in different, in different plane. One posterior, one anterior, but the plane is not a chest plane. It's not a barrel. It is a small scapula, which is like thin like paper and have muscle, they're almost hugging each other. So this is how you want to think about it. If you think about how thin the scapula is, it's almost paper thin sometimes the body of the scapula, not the lateral border or medial border. And the three muscles hugging each other. If, if you remove this one millimeter of bone, the infra is hugging, the subscap is hugging the supra. Their line of pull is so similar. They're, they're, they're holding hands. So whenever you want to transfer muscle, it is for the three of them, the only thing is whether you want to transfer it to one in the front or in the back, which they are but still hugging each other. And for the lower trapezius, it will be perfect for the back. Can you transfer it anterior? Yes, you can. Can you transfer it superior? Yes, you can, because it's the same vector. So this is, you can see right now, but it's perfectly better for the infraspinatus or the posterior superior rotator cuff. Now the line of pull, we satisfied. The, for the tension, we always like latissimus because it has a huge tension and we like it. We don't need it because if you look, the latissimus excursion is a huge, sorry, I'm talking about excursion. It's a huge excursion, huge. It's shortened too much. If you look at the race measure, also big, 
But look at the trapezius, it's smaller. Look at the rotator cuff. They have very small excursion. They are very short muscles. Why do you want to put something huge to put them for the excursion? And the lower trapezius, even if you don't see it, if you dissect it very well, this is the origin of the lower trapezius detached during surgery. This is I transferred for the triceps, in fact. But you can see the nice excursion of the lower trapezius. Now, this is satisfied as well. What about tension? Strengths. You think the latissimus is huge, it means you have straight good strength. It's not correct. If you look at the deltoid, it's the best tension you have around all the muscle around the shoulder. And the rotator cuff follow. But if you look, you'll be surprised. Look at the tension of the latissimus. So if you think about it, the rotator cuff have high tension, low excursion. The latissimus has high excursion, low tension, the reverse completely, while the trapezius has very similar tension and excursion. So now we satisfy D3, okay? And this is a patient with, this is a bigger incision. Of course, now we go do smaller incision. This is, I think I've done it either for paralysis or for reverse shoulder arthroplasty, but I'm showing you the strengths of contraction. It's strong. But when you do a harvest through small incision, you don't see the whole, the whole area very well. So now we concluded that yes, the lower trapezius is adequately satisfies all the principle of tendon transfer for the posterior superior rotator cuff. Are we done? No, because when we did the first lower trapezius early on, we thought like, and this is a, everyone asked this question because we thought we need tendon allograft. You can see this is the first case I did in 2007, huge incision, expose the muscle, put the Achilles tendon, cut part of the spine of the scapula. I did the transfer because it was the first time after we did the anatomic and biomechanical study. But then, because we were, at that time I was dealing mostly with brachial plexus injury, I realized, and you can see again, this is lower trapezius in the lateral position, huge incision, brachial plexus, detach the deltoid because it's paralyzed. And now let's dissect the infraspinatus. Remember, in brachial plexus, the infraspinatus is paralyzed but not torn. Almost very small percentages they have tear. So the tendon is intact and the tendon bone interface is your best interface because in brachial plexus, the bone is like butter. You try to put an anchor, it pulls out. So if you dissect the tendon nicely and tease the muscle from around it, most of you think that the infraspinatus tendon is like one, two centimeter length. If you tease the muscle from around it, it's like four, five centimeter length at least, and some people even more. That's the infraspinatus tendon. So in brachial plexus, you can potentially, I'm marking the tendon here, here you can potentially do perform direct transfer of the infraspinatus to the tendinous portion of the, uh, of the lower trapezius, the tendinous portion of the infraspinatus, okay? And you can see this is after the transfer. Look at the line. If I showed you this to so anyone, and I tell you what's this one, you look at it this way, spine of the scapula is here, this is infraspinatus. No, this is lower trapezius after the transfer. It looks like an infraspinatus. And remember, it's hugging it. We're talking about the hugging. This is hugging it as well. So this is also an advantage in brachial plexus. And you can see, again, this is another patient. You can see the line of pull very nicely with direct transfer. Now let's talk even better biomechanics. And this is something I want you all to think about because we, what we did, we did a state-of-the-art model, which is like the uh, hemitorso. We took it full and we, we placed it on a board and we were able to replicate the line of pull very well of each muscle transfer. Now, uh, I'm going to show you the next slide, but I want to, like, if someone wants to ask me this question, we're going to get to it. Can you do a latissimus transfer on a patient who has deltoid paralysis? No. Deltoid weakness, forbidden. What about if you have a subscap insufficiency? No. And this is a Christian Gerber, Herbert Resch. Now, ask yourself this question. Why not? If a muscle is really replicating the function of the rotator cuff very well, you should be able to do it regardless, right? For instance, if you have a patient with deltoid paralysis and, and he has rotator cuff and he has an infraspinatus tear, would you repair it? Yes. Will he do well? Most likely, yes, even though he has deltoid paralysis. So when you're trying to do the rotator cuff repair, the patients still do well, even they don't have a deltoid. Now, if you don't have deltoid and you do latissimus, the patient will subluxate. If you do lower trapezius and you have no deltoid, the patient will do well. And this is again, again, showing you that biomechanically, the latissimus is much better to replicate the function of the rotator cuff. And this is gonna be on the next slide. So in this one, we try to keep the subscap and take the deltoid off. Look what happened. Latissimus transfer, boom, it subluxate. It's, it it external rotate and boom, it subluxate the shoulder down. If you do the same procedure and you do biomechanics, you have external rotation and some abduction. 
So the lower trap imparts stability of the shoulder when you have no deltoid, while latissimus import instability, which again and again indicate that biomechanically, lower trapezius much, much better mimic the function of the rotator cuff. All of these advantages will add in one more advantage, which is extremely, in my opinion, very extremely important. When you train the latissimus transfer after uh, for massive rotator cuff tear posterior superior, you have to do so many maneuvers because the latissimus usually does not fire either during rotation, external rotation or during flexion. So now you have to train that muscle to fire every time you external rotate or flex when you have a massive posterior superior rotator cuff. And you, it is not easy. And I remember when I was back here <laughs> years ago with a GP Warner, he used to do a J maneuver when they go in to activate it and do flexion. This patient, we're asking the patient, this is an EMG. I took it from a friend of mine from France. This is the needle of the EMG in the lower trap. You're asking just the patient to external rotate the shoulder. Just external rotate the shoulder. Look what happened. This is a lower trap. It's firing. So this is also a muscle that's very easy to train because normally when you external rotate the shoulder, and sometimes when you flex, the lower trapezius activate. So you can see the advantages one after one why we like this muscle transfer. And for this reason, we start to do it. And this is a brachial plexus patient, lower trapezius transfer. And you can see this is a mission I did it overseas. And you can see he had external rotation. Sometimes if they don't have very good elbow fun function, we give them what we call it the Bio Elbow Pro that will help flex the elbow. And this patient, among uh, other transfer, I did the external rotation, lower trapezius transfer. And now she is much more functional because she can use her hand for functionality. For obstetric brachial plexus, even if they fail latissimus transfer, the same, you can do it. So we were, we were able to see predictable improvement in shoulder external rotation. In more than 500 cases, we've done four brachial plexus injury. So, so if with all these advantages, if it worked for all the brachial plexus and have all the advantages, why will not work for massive rotator cuff tear? And this is why we start to apply it for massive rotator cuff tear. And early on, we did it open uh, through an open technique, a transacromial approach. And we, we report about the outcome, which is really very good outcome, including patient with pseudoparalysis. And this is a patient who had a pseudoparalytic shoulder and we did for him an open lower trap and you can see his function after surgery. He did extremely, extremely well. And uh, these patients, even though they're fluffy, they still do well. Like some patients, they say like, uh, they should not do them if they are very, et cetera. They're not, it's not true. And then of course we progress from open to arthroscopic assisted approach. And this is when a lot of you, a few ask me questions. And since the COVID time, we had so many meeting and I have questions after question about the lower trapezius. And we're gonna talk about them and how to avoid failure when you do an arthroscopic assisted lower trapezius or what we call it the scope assisted lower trapezius, salt. You know, the salt, sugar and salt, salt. Scope assisted lower trapezius. So patient selection is very important. Most of the patients I do are patients who are young, active, who have a massive irreparable posterior superior rotator cuff tear. And irreparable, it means advanced fatty atrophy. Most of them, they have no teres minor. Some of them, they do. You can see what they do. They extend the elbow to do external rotation because there is no external rotation, proximal migration, mild arthritis. Okay? Now, some coexistent factor may affect the outcome, but not necessarily contraindication for the lower trapezius. And we're gonna go through one after one. And these are questions I get always asked, and I'm gonna answer them right now. Can you do lower trapezius if you have subscap tear? Absolutely. In fact, most of our patients, up to 60%, when we do the SALT, scope assisted lower trap, they do have a subscap tear. And you can see here from, we're looking posterior, this is an irreparable posterior superior rotator cuff. So we're looking from posterior, and you can see how the shoulder is subluxated because there's no infra, no supra. And many of these patients, they have dynamic posterior instability. And when you look anterior, you can see a almost full thickness tear of the subscap. Uh, and this is, we see it on a lot, a lot of patients. And you can see this one here. Does it affect outcome? Not really. You can repair the subscap and you do the salt and the patient do extremely, extremely well. And uh, even if the patient have uh, a ER lag, they do extremely well. Now, what about an irreparable subscap? We spoke about it, okay? So if you have an irreparable subscap, yes, you can do the lower trapezius. However, you cannot do it by itself because now uh, for the first couple, you're reconstructing the posterior, but not the anterior. So you remember that house needs to be balanced. So if you transfer posterior, you need to transfer anterior to reconstruct 
this. So in this case, we do the parachute and the parachute procedure is transferring the lower trapezius for the posterior superior tetra cuff and latissimus for anterior superior tetra cuff. And uh, patient, not all of them, they get home run, but these are patients that they really were heading for reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And if you can give them 120, 130 degrees, and this patient, some, some of them really do superb. And this patient is a farmer from Minnesota. He was super happy because they told him he need a reverse and we did it for him. And you can see, he got very good flexion, shoulder external rotation, he went back to farming. And the parachute could be also done with latissimus uh, anterior and teres major posterior as well. And this is how we used to do them early on. Now, what about advanced atrophy of teres minor, approximate gestational humeral head? Yes, most of the patients, in fact, have this problem. In fact, Philippe Valenti, when he, when, uh, like here is now, he liked the lower trap and I'm very happy, as well as George Othwell. And for Philippe, his indication, the main indication, if you have posterior superior tetra cup with no teres minor. And now he routinely does the uh, lower trap. Of note, very early on in his series, he used to, th uh, uh, I used to have a discussion with him and he used to believe that for a forward deflection, we do the latissimus and for external rotation, we do lower trapezius. My friends, the, 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 when we do the transfer, the latissimus does not give you this flexion. You have to think about restoring the, the force couple. It's not like one tendon puts the sh uh, shoulder up to do flexion and another one give you rotation. No, either tendon are giving you a function, but they're trying to restore the force couple, which is the basic principle of anything about the rotator cuff for the deltoid to function very well. So for early on, he used to do latissimus. If the patient have an abduction, external rotation weakness and the trapezius, if they have AR weakness on the side, and sometimes he does both if the patient have these two. And I used to tell him, honestly, you don't have to do both. And in reality, he stopped doing it completely, the latissimus transfer, because he did not find any difference. And now whenever he does have posterior superior tetra cuff, no teres minor, he does lower trapezius transfer only. And these are some of the patients, posterior superior uh, with no teres minor. This is bilateral, by the way. He's still compensating on, on the left. And we did the right side. And this is him up the right side. We did the left side later and he did very well. Now, now patient who have a true pseudo paralysis and very young, uh, and look at this patient, you can see he's shrugging his shoulder. He honestly does, does not have more than 30 degrees. He has no ER, no supra, no supra, uh, infra, no teres minor. And you can see this patient, you can get them to 120, 130, maybe more. And they keep on improving over time, even after years, sometime too. And at least you can get them also the shoulder external rotation that did not have. And this patient was in the early 40, he was 41. And you can see his external rotation after surgery. So this is something to take into consideration before jumping uh, into reverse shoulder arthroplasty. What about deltoid weakness and paralysis? I guess we answered this question, right? Because this is what we do. All brachial plexus patient, they have no deltoid and you can do it. And because it mimics the function, you'll be able to do it without that. What about shoulder arthritis? This is the tricky one. Mild arthritis is completely okay, but there's one, uh, one category we're gonna talk about it in a second. In general, if you have uh, arthritis up to Hamada two, I think it's reasonable to do it, but you always have to warn the patient that the outcome may not be as predictable as someone who has no arthritis, but I don't do it beyond uh, Hamada two. But there's a category that Pascal Boileau talked about and I, we all see it. Sometimes you have advanced arthritis, no pain with only isolated loss of external rotation. So they have full flexion, they have abduction, but they have no ER. They have advanced arthritis, but they have no pain. These patients, many surgeons jump to do a reverse on with latissimus transfer, which I think is a big mistake. I'll tell you why. Because these patients have full flexion, they have full abduction, full internal rotation, no external rotation. Now remember, when you do your, your, your reverse, First of all, you cannot guarantee to get all this full flexion. Some you do, but you cannot guarantee it. The abduction is the same. Definitely not internal rotation in many patients. And ER, if you have complete lack, sometimes you can get it up, but not great. So be careful about the patient who have no pain. They have very good range of motion, but no ER with arthritis to jump immediately into reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So you can do a tendon transfer. And... Uh, uh, for these patients, when they have, they have advanced arthritis, you discuss with them the option 
of the reverse, but you tell them what to expect. Otherwise, they'll be very disappointed. But you'll be surprised at some of these patients. You do uh, the lower trap on, and they do extremely well, at least for, uh, for me, the longest follow-up I have probably is around four years. So I don't know how long they're going to last. What about failed SCR? Well, absolutely, yes. I have right now, we're going to report our series. I think we have uh, 18 patients so far that they have a failed SCR for different reasons. And we did on them lower trapezius transfer and they've done uh, very, very well. And you can see this patient. Also, a farmer, if you notice his hand uh, and he has, um, he has already interesting negative uh, hand, um, he has Charcomary tooth, yes. So, but he's very active farmer and we did for him lower trap after SCR and he did extremely well. So now what else can we do to minimize failure for lower trap? And, and just, we talked about patient selection. Now let's talk about surgical technique. Uh, this is a patient uh, I've done uh, life surgery in Barcelona with Dr. Hashem, my friend. And this patient has a massive rotator cuff tear on both sides, but she's still compensating on the left, but the right side, she has no ER. No AR, neither in AD deduction nor in AB deduction. And the main reason I'm presenting her because it's a life surgery. Like this is not something in my institution I'm doing, okay? So, uh, and we did uh, for her uh, arthroscopic assisted lower trapezius. And these are the steps. Uh, patient positioning, I like uh, the beach chair position. Some people they do ask me about lateral, you can, but the lateral you have to hold the arm at the end of the case. Very good marking of the medial spine of the scapula and the medial border. That angle here below it is going to be sitting the lower trapezius all the time. And you make your incision. Once you do the incision, this is what I tell the resident and fellows, always cut the fat. Always cut the fat. Otherwise, you're not going to see the tendon. Once you cut the fat and you do the marking correct, you see a white structure, which is a tendon. You take it and you pull on it and boom, this is your lower trapezius. You can see it very well right now but don't open and immediately expecting you, not, you wanna see it. And once, once you see it, you take a, I usually like electrocautery, but you can use knife if you want to, but electrocautery will give me signal also how close I am to the nerve. And I detach from under surface to, this of, to the spine of the scapula and start to detach it. And once you reflect it, you see very nice shining tendon. And this is your tendon of the lower trapezius. I uh, almost routinely place a suture to reinforce this lateral border of the, uh, the lower trapezius because later I like to do a pulver taft where passing the tendon around, the, around this portion uh, and, and flip it on itself. So this portion has to be uh, strong uh, and reinforced, okay? Now, and this is, this is all the excursion that you need. I know it's very appealing to see that this is moving big and huge, but this is all the excursion that you need. You don't need more than that. Now look at this fascia here. This is the infraspinatus fascia. The infraspinatus fascia is the fascia you need to open in order to pass the trapezius and uh, the Achilles tendon in. Now, usually as we're doing this part of the procedure, a member will be preparing this Achilles tendon allograft. Now we, we are trying to, to design a, a, a pre-suture tendon that we'll be able to use and usually we color part of the tendon, which will make it super easy to use during surgery. And uh, during surgery, uh, as usual, you try to do a bursectomy if you have, the breathe the rest of the rotator cuff. And uh, uh, this is the infraspinatus fascia again that I told you about. I excise a big hole on it. What's a big deal? No big deal whatsoever. It's just a fascia. So you cut the big uh, part of it. This fascia is over the infra and stop at the medial border of the posterior deltoid. So once you open it and you put anything deep to it, you are in the interval between the deltoid and the infraspinatus, okay? So now, once you open this fascia, you pass the graft, it's gonna be between the infra and deltoid and you take it to the subacromal space. And uh, because it's already pre-sutured, you sutured it. Once you are, uh, you, the, the tuberosity is prepared, you put a, uh, you, you anchor it anteriorly. For the posterior superior rotator cuff, we anchor it on the anterior footprint of the supraspinatus. For infraspinatus only, we enter it to, on the lateral border of infraspinatus. So now we're going to go looking either from the scope anterior or lateral, and I take my long uh, grasping instrument. Usually I use uh, what you call the eye stomp from the hip scope from Arthrex, and you go in that interval between the infraspinatus and deltoid toward that opening of the fascia. And you can see here I'm pushing, and boom, here it is. 
and should not be like struggle and push and etc. It should not be. It should be a smooth passage. But you may have to push a little bit because the space at the angle between the posterior acromion and the infrared could be slightly uh, tight angle. This is why you have to push it below, beyond it, but don't push through the muscle. And now uh, you push the graft in this opening, but, and now again, remember, this is going between the deltoid and infra, and you can see the graft coming in with the suture in it. And here it is easy because you're prepared and you have the, it's pre-sutured. You take uh, the medial ones and you anchor them, and you can see this is the coloration of the graft. You can anchor it first on the anterior medial footprint of the supraspinatus, and then you take the lateral one and you anchor it laterally as well. Now, I usually routinely use also a slightly posterior medial anchor from the divisor portal, and I pass it from medial to lateral to reinforce, to reinforce the tendon. Or if you've done any type of repair, you can also use the same sutures. In general, with advanced fatty atrophy, I don't do any type of repair because it is uh, useless. Now, once you are done with your repair, you can, uh, this is how, this is a question also I get asked very often, I position the shoulder in abduction external rotation. Why? In this position, remember, the graft is coming from here to here, right? When you put abduction external rotation, now the graft is almost here. So it shortened the distance of the graft. The shortening is helpful when you pass the graft around the rotor pieces to tension it. Instead of taking and like and pulling and yanking on it, you can put enough tension and suture it and once you put the shoulder, take it out of a, a B duction, it will tension the tendon for you. So, so now we split the thin portion of the Achilles tendon allograft, usually discard one portion, and then we weave the tendon inside the area. And this is why we reinforce it. We reinforce this area and we pass the graft and this portion we excise and we suture it very nicely. Uh, and this is essentially it. Once you are done with this part, Usually, we position the shoulder in AD duction external rotation. You take it from AB duction and you put it in AD duction external rotation. Now, for this is like all the steps of the surgery. Now, there are a few pinpointer because again, I get asked this one often, and I think I'll be done very very soon. This is a setup that I have it, the instrument on one side and the camera on the opposite side. The bony landmark, when you do them, make sure to do the bony landmark as wherever you position the shoulder, don't move it anymore. Remember, the house is moving. When the house is moved, the tendon move with it. So let's say you put the shoulder in slight flexion traction, you position, you don't move it until you har harvest the muscle. After that, doesn't matter because here, when you do your portals and you move, doesn't matter because this is next to bone, but the muscle, the trapezius change direction and, and don't don't change your your position when you do your marking okay and this is again exactly the same what we talk about for the harvesting now uh again and again this is reinforcement medial spine medial border and you make an, a line around three to four centimeters starting from this point and you aim it distally when you aim it distally that line here, which is distal to the medial spine of the scapula, is going to have the lower trapezius. You make your incision, you cut your fat, always cut the fat out. Once you cut the fat, look, you see a structure white, that's your tendon. That's your tendon. Okay? And the Achilles tendon allograft preparation, it's usually done on the side of the table as we are doing our surgeries. And we spoke about these and the passage and everything else. So I just wanted to, to just show you this. And uh, uh, one more thing here I want to show. This is at the end of the case. You take the shoulder from abduction external rotation into a deduction external rotation. And notice the line of pull. Internal external rotation, you can see very nicely uh, the reconstruction is going along the line of pull of the infraspinatus. Okay. The post-op is usually patient. We put them in gunslinger in an ER for six to eight weeks and active assisted residential function for eight weeks and then strengthening for uh, 16 weeks. I like aqua therapy a lot, but you tell the patient not to swim early on. They do water exercises early on and then swimming later. And this is our patient. Remember, I showed it to you and this is her three and a half months. I forgot to put the video he sent me. She's one year right now. She is doing excellent. She's really just waiting to have now her other arm done because now her other arm, her ER leg is getting much worse. And uh, this is our paper about the arthroscopic outcome of arthroscopic assisted lower trapezius transfer 
you can read it in GSES, uh, 41 patient, average age 52. Notice it's not 60 or 70, it's 52. 19 with true pseudo paralysis, 31 with the ER lag, and 51 patient with a subscap there, and 31 with proximal migration. 37 patient has significant improvement of all outcome measure, VAS, uh, SSV dash. All patient has significant improvement of shoulder external rotation. 17 out of 19 had reversal of the pseudo paralysis and two patients had traumatic rupture of the transfer and two patients require reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And I think I am done, which give us also some time to have discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you indeed, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think I'll ask uh, Ram to initiate yes. discussion. Ram, uh, in the chat yes. box, there are so many questions. So I think- Yes, absolutely. Have... Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, IPS. Uh, thank you, Basim, for your brainstorming uh, session. And a very uh, clear cut, step by step technique, logic, rational, irrefutable evidence behind your uh, decision. Uh, I you. think I like, I like your FAQ section as well. You Thank yourself you. covered half of the questions after your talk, because I'm sure you had been doing these uh, lectures in a great number. <laughs> yes, of yes, yes. But That's we right. have more questions here. Now, first question okay. first the allograft uh, tendo Achilles looks to be a fantastic option to stitch to the footprint as well as to the uh, trapezius and the tension, but we don't have much allograft facility here. So what is your alternative? And, so, uh, so my next presentation, I'm going to add this one to the questions, by the way, because this yeah, question yeah. is asked very, very commonly, by the way. So yes. this is an excellent question. So in Canada, they don't have as much allograft. In France, they don't have as much allograft. So both uh, Philippe right now and uh, uh, Jean Cany and uh, uh, George Arthwal and even Laurent Lafosse, they're using tibialis posterior allograft. Uh, sorry, sorry, they're using the hamstring. hamstring. So what they do, they double the hamstring, they double it, and they put, they attach it the way I do it. Now, the technique for each of them is different. Like, uh, I think George Arthwal like to make a big hole in the back and put the tibialis, uh, sorry, I, I don't know why I do tibialis posterior, the hamstring through that hole with an endo button on the opposite side. Uh, I think Laurent Lafosse does like, essentially you double it and do the same repair as I do. Just the fixation technique. Everything else is exactly the same. Okay. Is, is there any difference between using allograft or autograft in this uh, uh, section? So, so far, if I, can pay, if I compare my outcome to those that right now, uh, uh, I think George has at least close to 30. And I think, uh, 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 what's his name? Philippe already published about them. I cannot find difference because their outcome similar to mine. So, so far, I think they are similar. I like the Achilles because of a really nice thick tendon. It replicates the rotator cuff, but so far there's no known. There's no difference based on their study. I haven't done hamstring except overseas. Okay. I've done it overseas because as you say, there's no Achilles tendon. So I've done it. Those I've done, they've done extremely well. Excellent. And what is your post-op protocol after lower trapezius transfer? How long you keep the brace? So myself, I do it slightly different than others I because know. I really like them to stay fully immobilized in external rotation for ideally around six weeks, ideally eight weeks, but six, like seven weeks is okay. Now, some people worry about stiffness is not true. Remember, when the shoulder is in external rotation, the rotator interval is open, the capsule is stretched. So you rarely ever get stiffness. And I think you should give enough time for this to heal. The big difference between the posterior superior tetra cuff versus anterior superior tetra cuff is everything pull you anterior. Your yes. gravity put your hand on your belly. Everything is anterior. So this is why this one requires much more protection. Okay. For, for a case with the irreparable cuff tear with the severe pseudo paralysis, uh, I think I know your answer. But there is a question from the audience. Can we combine LT transfer with uh, some other uh, technique like rerouted biceps or SCR? Do you do that? Or uh, you'll be enough to address even a very bad massive. Uh, uh, like so, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, and this is a question. We, we had a webinar with, uh, with, uh, with Arthrex with some of my friends who do like uh, we do SCR a lot. Uh, for me, when you already have a technique that is working and it's dynamic transfer. Yes. I don't have a reason to do anything else. Yeah, I agree. Because especially, uh, it, especially, especially when you evolved it. As yes. you notice right now, when we show the technique, the technique is not difficult. In fact, yesterday, one of my friends, Sharif, he called me. He had the, the first two lower trap. And we talked on the phone, he watched the video. One took him an hour and a half, one took him one, one hour, 15 minutes. It was the first time. So once you do the technique, because you develop steps, they're easy, the complication is low, 
I, I find no reason to do anything else. And if you think about it, if you've done SCR, that's easier than SCR because you pass the yes. graph and you anchor, it's easier. Yes. So anyway, no, I have no reason to do anything else. No. Yes. I agree with that because compared to SCR, this restores power to the shoulder. The right. SCR doesn't restore power. Whereas uh, right. lower trapezius stands for restore external rotation power and is dynamic. Now, my question to you is that if you have a very bad uh, uh, repairable cuff tear, but there is a high risk of re rupture uh, due to some other reasons, would you add this lower trapezius transfer as an addendum to a cuff repair? That's an excellent question. Yesterday, yes, and I, I, I got this question yesterday as well from one of the surgeons. Absolutely, it's a low risk surgery. And if you feel you're not sure, like one of the patients yesterday they've done, they've done twice repair and it failed and they, have a, they wanna do a third time and they wanna see like, maybe I can repair it this time. What's the point? Augment it and you're always protected. So yes, I will do it as an augmentation if I have a doubt about certain repairs. This uh, coming back to uh, subscapularis uh, questions. Ram, if you have a, yes. Dr. Ram, yes, uh, this is Dr. Samantha. Samantha. Yeah, because hi, Elason. This is Dr. Samantha from Calcutta. The question yes, is so, because, because joining me, Dr. Ram and IPS was discussing because we when you read your papers, you are probably your retracted at the yeah, chronic subscap is a one of the contraindication of doing this lower subscap, uh, lower uh, trap transfer. So during your talk also, you have uh, talked about the subscap. So what is your take home on the subscap needle? About if you have an irreparable subscap? Yes, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I mentioned it in presentation. I, I, I mentioned it among one of the reasons. So if you have, and uh, I have at least uh, around 20 patients right now, who I call it the pan rotator cuff tear, which is posterior superior, anterior superior, and irreparable. And I do the parachute procedure, lower trap from the back, latissimus from the front. The only, among these patients, I think 16, they've done extremely well. The patient that they don't do very well are those who have this tear, this kind of tear with a frank fixed anterior superior escape. If you have a frank anterior superior escape, no matter what you do, they fail. But if you don't have it, if it's, if it's like a dynamic instability is going everywhere, but it's not frank escape, if you do that transfer anterior, that word trapeze transfer posterior, they do very, very well. Basam, do you dynamically examine these patients under a fluoroscopy to see whether the head is reducing well before surgery? How do you... No, no, no. This is a good question as well. Not really. Not really because uh, the proximal migration is really a problem. And during surgery, when you put them under traction, you, you, will, you will know it, you know, if it's working or not. If not, and this is something, to be honest with you, I learned it from, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, from, uh, uh, I will remember, um, he, Savoie, body Savoie, I perform inferior uh, capsule release. Okay, okay. So inferior then, capsule yeah. release, yes. But this is not as common, except those who really have fixed proximal migration. So, uh, many more questions. Any more here. questions? Yeah, moving yeah there, to, are, there are, there are. Moving to uh, subscapularis irreparable tear, uh, where you do, as uh, my question to you, uh, basically, between doing open technique and scope assisted technique, yeah. which one is preferable? Because with the open technique, you need to uh, uh, damage the pectoralis major to access to the latissimus dorsi, isn't it? Yeah. No, uh, honestly, you can do either depending on your comfort. For now, right now, I rarely do open whenever it's only like a subscap tear or I don't need to do any kind of augmentation. Uh, because uh, you get such a good excursion with with uh, with the open technique through the posterior approach and arthroscopic passage. The only disadvantage of the anterior technique, <clears throat> not the pectoralis. You can do a small incision. You can go below, be, be distal to the pectoralis and go. You'll be able to lacerate one centimeter repair. It should not be a big deal. Yes. But the excursion, if you have a only subscap tear it's okay enough because you can dissect because you have the radial nerve. Remember, I showed you the radial nerve yes. and you cannot dissect beyond it to get you this nice excursion. So if you want to get this excursion to the subscap only, it's okay. But if you have an anterior superior tear and okay. you want to get the latissimus all the way to the anterior footprint of the supra, you cannot do it only with the, with the anterior approach. This is why I like this one more. Okay. Thank you. We have a question about uh, any, you have any higher age limit for tendon transfer and what is your absolute contraindication to do this? 
uh, a, honestly, age for me is just, uh, it's, it's just a number. So I'll tell you why though. Because again, again, as you know, I know in Boston, in Minnesota, we have a lot of farmers. A 70, 75 years old farmer, they lift, they cut trees, they lift cows, they do things more than me and you. This is, you cannot say he's 70, you cannot do anything, no. But they, it's a not an easy post-op rehab. So if someone is older, they have some arthritis, there's no point to do it, honestly. I think it's, it's too much. For someone who's physiologically young, I will do it. If the arthritis is more than hamata too, I will not do it. So yes, there are certain absolute contraindication. If you have advanced arthritis, someone older, low key, this one you can do reverse on them, it will be easier and better, so. Basim, uh, uh, does healing if, uh, is affected by smokers? Uh, in smokers, are you refusing surgery or is it uh, rehab is slow? Uh, th that's also a good question. To be honest with you, I haven't had issues to go back and see, ah, this is smoking, this why it failed. Those that failed, mostly it was rupture. It was rupture because the traumatic rupture. So I haven't had uh, issues without, like with this. Now to be also fair, not every single one. Remember Minnesota, they go and travel to Minnesota. They cannot come back. So they're doing well, usually they don't come back. It will be great if we'll be able to get an MRI on every single one over time to see how they do. Those who have done MRI on all of them, did not, I did not see any detachment, except those who fell and they ruptured the tendon. So I don't, I, I don't know the answer to this one because I did not look for it. As a question regarding if you want to decide to do open approach the entire procedure, what will be your incision over the shoulder? How do you approach it? So for the anterior approach is if this is mostly for the subscap, which is for the subscap, you do your standard deltopectoral, retract the deltoid, the subscap is torn. If you try to dissect and find the subscap, it's fine to just to close capsule, it doesn't matter. And then you have two ways to do this one. One, if you, if you get enough experience, you can make the incision distal, dissect the pectoralis proximal and distal and retract it in internal rotation. You can see the latissimus deep to it and you can detach it without detaching the pec. Or early on, if you haven't done many of these, very simple, just cut the proximal, maybe centimeter of the pec, keep a cuff to be able to repair yes. it. And then, this still to the leash, this still to your sister, you're going to find the latissimus. In fact, in most of our shoulder replacement, you see it. And yes. sometimes you're illustrated, we don't know it. It's just yes, distal. We look at the capsule, it's just distal to that. It's very easy to find. The interval between latissimus and teres major is much easier to find proximal. Yes. If you have a conjoint tendon, it's usually more distal than proximal. So, thank you. Uh, Hello. Yes, I'll Russian. give you. I'll give you. I'll give you two more minutes. I have to run. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah last, last question. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, is. Uh, uh, it is just related to the process of degeneration, which has already been st started, and uh, how easy to stop that degeneration in a reconstructed tendon, especially when you use allograft for your tendon transfer. So. Do you see a similar kind of degeneration in your tendons, especially in an elderly patient? Oh, good question. You're talking about the Achilles tendon. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, those who I went in, like, so I have uh, the longest follow-up I have is on a patient, who, the first patient I've done, which is like 13 years ago, almost like now. And uh, that patient still have external rotation. He had nothing. He's paralyzed. Like this patient, there's no... It's not like you have some teres minor, this one has external rotation, has reverse lateralized. So the tendon, and we did an ultrasound. So at 13 years or 12 years, the tendon was there. Now, I have a number of patients, two patients, I think. I have, no, two, yes, two patients. One with biceps and one who had bicep tendonitis, uh, did not have biceps pain early on, but developed biceps pain after three years. So I went in just to do bicep tenotomy and look at the graft and took a biopsy. And another patient who has Hamada 3, she wanted to still have the lower trap. I did it. She did extremely well for three years also. And then I did the reverse on. And this patient, I was able to see the lower trap three years after surgery, and I took a biopsy. The biopsy showed that they have living fibroblasts inside the tendon. Remember this area, the, the big advantage of this area is it is so vascular. So what's the difference between the Achilles tendon and the SCR, for example. The SCR, you're sitting the graft in the synovial fluid on the glenoid, 
on the humerus and you're trying to anchor it. With the lower trap, you are trying to anchor the broad on the tuberosity, and then it's passing between infra and deltoid vascular area and going attached to the trapezius vascular area. So it is surrounded by kind of like vascularity. And so I really think this is why it lasts and this is why it does very well and does not degenerate easily. But I think now I know much more people are doing the technique and we're gonna start to collect this data more and more. Like I have some of my friend doing uh, MRI at one year and two years and we're gonna do the same. We're gonna start to look into this but luckily, I would say so far, I haven't seen major degeneration. Again, the one I've seen are ruptured, but no degeneration, but we should look into this one. This is a very good question. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Thank I, you there is one more question uh, in the chat box. Uh, Raghu has asked, uh, when you do an open approach for lower trapezius transfer, what is your incision over the shoulder? So I'm sorry I did not show it because of the timing. So what I usually do, I do a saber incision around okay. the lateral acromion and I do an osteotomy five millimeter. I'll tell you why. You can do through a split approach, but you know, I deal with deltoid paralysis all the time and stuff. Mm -hmm. The split approach protect the axillary nerve a lot. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the, the, the osteotomy protect the nerve because it relaxes the deltoid and it gives yeah. you huge exposure. And now the deltoid has a small piece of bone that you can repair back to, this is what I usually used to do. But if you want to do it, you don't want to do any repair, just hook the tendon. You can do an anterolateral incision, just hook it and pass it by and you can fix it this way as well. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Very good. Man. Last burning Thank questions. You very much, man. It's, it All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much. It went, I'm glad it went Thank well you. and we'll see you. We'll see you around. Hopefully we'll see you in person soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thank you. Take care, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Oh, I like the clap. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank see, you. See you. Good. Thank you. Right. Sandeep, thank you for putting up this show. A wonderful, Ram. Uh, thank you. Friends, thank you, IBS. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, friends, we have a very interesting webinar tomorrow uh, on a topic which has not been discussed at all in any previous meetings. And we are going to talk about core muscle injuries. Uh, uh, the presentation is essentially a lot about sports medicine. We have experts of sports medicine joining in tomorrow. Do, live, uh, do join in IES YouTube channel mm -hmm. at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Dr. William Myers and Dr. Alexander are going to put up a good program and the program is moderated by Dr. Denshaw Padiwala. Uh, this would be a program where we talk about core muscle injuries, how to, uh, the surgical anatomy, how to radiologically see it, how to diagnose it and the basic rehabilitation principles. So do uh, join in tomorrow, 7th November, Saturday at 7pm on IES YouTube channel for this wonderful webinar.